Hello and welcome back Architect Nation. Today we're going to get into something that keeps many architects up late at night, whether you own and run a firm or whether you happen to work for a firm and that is risk management, liability, construction defects, contracts, negotiations, and everything that goes along with that. So perhaps not your favorite topic, but something that is very, very important to your practice as a licensed professional. And I'm joined today by two experts who have were introduced to me by the uh, leadership over American Institute of Architects. First of all, Mike Kroger, AI Esquire. He's a senior manager and counsel for the AI contract documents. Uh, previous to joining the AI, he actually practiced civil litigation, primarily representing contractors and property owners in construction related disputes. So we're going to get his feedback and kind of the things that he generally sees being the biggest issues on products so you know what to look out for. And as an architect, he also uh, practiced as well, worked on some medical facilities, research and development facilities, and some residences. So he has an interesting background as, as both a, an attorney and as an architect. Salvatore B. Ver Verastro, AIA, is a principal of Spillman Farmer Architects, and he's been doing that since 1983. His expert knowledge of construction specifications, materials, and methods makes him an expert in the things we're going to be talking about today. He's an expert in roofing and building forensics. He has a broad understanding of design and construction, and that is why he participates on the committee that participates in facilitating, identifying issues, and updating the AI contract documents. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get into today's, today's podcast episode. If you haven't already, Get free instant access to the four-part architecture from Profit Map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. That's freearchitectgift.com. And your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. And with that, let's get on with today's show. Mike and Sal, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Enoch. Glad to be here. So before we jumped on, we brainstormed a couple topics. One of them was risk management. And I'd like to start out by asking you, Mike, what would you say, what is risk management? When we think of that word, what does that actually mean? Sure. Um, well, I guess off the top of my head, you know, in any professional endeavor as an architect, as an attorney, you are providing services and there are risks inherent in doing architectural work. Um, you've got an owner who expects you to you know, design a project for you to be competent about it. Um, but, but risk management is, you know, is understanding the relationship that you're going to be in with the owner uh, and properly, you know, putting to, not only putting together contracts, but it's setting expectations with your owner. It is managing from a firm perspective um, all of the risks that go into the professional practice of architecture from, you know, your licensure to contracts to claims analysis and catching issues before they get uh, to um, a more problematic uh, state. So that's, I guess, what it means for me. Sal, how about yourself? I think um, playing off what Mike just said, first of all, as an architect, we have to um, manage the risk from a standpoint of on every job. Is it worth the risk and what are the risks? Because every job's different. Uh, it's a different client. You don't, you don't, maybe don't know them that well, their expectations. Uh, even if you do know them well, it's if it's a different job, um, maybe you have different staff involved um, because of them coming and going. Um, so it may not run as smooth. Many times I think what happens is architects think, oh, we've done this before, we can do it again. Uh, we didn't have any trouble the first time. Why, why would you think anything would go uh, south on this particular job? It's the same thing. Well, uh, everything's different. Um, and, uh, even if it's the same exact location, same client, you have different people involved. Um, so I think that um, even the time factor, uh, I often find that one of the things that I'm always trying to assess is, the client's expectations on time, for example, they want it done a lot sooner, a lot faster. And that's a risk because 
um, you're talking about doing a lot of work in a minimal minimal time or shorter period with different people, um, uh, people working overtime. There's a there's a lot of risk you have to take uh, into account before you take on a project, particularly at a lower fee. Um, and, uh, and, and clients need to understand that as well. But mostly the architects have to just, just like a contractor, um, they I mean, obviously there's a lot of money involved in the construction part of it, but on our part, the liability is huge. If someone should get hurt, uh, from the, 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 the design that you put out or, um, they got hurt because you weren't following, you, you weren't, you weren't following the job along and didn't notice something. So th there's all, everything is risky. Every, everything you do is, has some amount of risk. Um, so I, I agree 100% with what Mike said, but, but even though you've done something once, doesn't mean the second time there's no risk, it, even if it's the same client. So you have to uh, evaluate it every single time. And from both of your experience, what are some typical risks that especially small, practice, small firm practitioners should be looking out for and should be aware of? Sure. Um, you want me to go ahead and start, Sal? Sure. Yeah. So the one that I always think about um, for architects in general, big firm, small firm, uh, is, uh, is, is, is being asked to do work that you're not getting paid for um, and that you had not maybe originally contracted for. Uh, architects, we're generalists. Uh, we tend to to know how to do a whole lot of different things, um, and because of that, because the position that architects find themselves in, you know, being the 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 key, you know, design professional who understands a little bit about all of the other sub kind of uh, trades and 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 other design consultants, they know something about. Uh, what the contractor's doing. They are the interface between owner and contractor. Architects get asked to do a heck of a lot of extra work um, that they, that they didn't, might not get paid for um, and that owners think is just a part of uh, the architect's, you know, basic services. So one thing I always tell folks, uh, you know, architects who are worried about things like scope creep um, is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I work for AIA National um, uh, in their contract contract documents department. So I'm going to shamelessly plug our B101 agreement. Um, but there is, you know, a large section of B101 that really deals with getting the architect paid for extra work uh, that they're doing that was not a part of their basic services. And that's uh, Article 4. I see that as one of the most valuable tools that architects can look at and can use to get paid for extra stuff that they're being asked to do and to educate owners that, uh, you know, basic design services, you're paying me a certain amount for that. But if you want me to, you know, um, to do, to change scope, you want me to do multiple designs, uh, solutions, that's something that's not my basic service. So that's something I should be getting paid extra for. Um, Sal, you have any? Yeah, I'd like to add, um, first of all, <laughs> big explanation point behind what he just said. First of all, getting paid in general um, is definitely a, a major issue, but Mike hit on hit the head on the nail with uh, ec extra services, additional services, and I see this happening from time and time again. Architects uh, taking on responsibility that's not theirs, whatever it is, reviewing things that's not theirs. It's like reviewing a shop drawing you didn't ask for. That's not your responsibility. So the architect should not be doing that. Um, and there are many times, uh, and, and I, I'm guilty of it, because we're, try, we're, we're nice people. We try to work with the owners as much as possible. And then we're taking on this responsibility that it's not in our contract. So one of the things I like about the AA documents is that not only does it many times spell out um, what the architect will do, but it's important to spell out what you won't do, uh, what's not included in, in this document or your, this contract that you're agreeing to so that the owner doesn't expect you to do something that in the end, it's not your responsibility. So I'm, I'm not going to do, I, I, we, we, I'm, again, I'm guilty of it. Our firm does this time and time again, and we, we cringe at it when we realize, oh my gosh, we went over a budget because the owner asked us to do something. We did a rendering. It's not even part of the contract because we're nice guys and we try to do it. Um, and, and then, then come along, uh, then comes along BIM and Revit and a whole new world of extra additional services uh, gets into the mix. So I absolutely agree with uh, that, that statement for sure. So scope creep definitely has an impact on the pocketbook. From a risk standpoint, what are some of the risks that architects might face if they get involved in stuff that's not a part of the scope? Well, one of the things that jumps into mind is you're not covered by your insurance. 
um, the, the, you know, what, if you do something that's um, uh, it's not in your original scope. It might not be covered by your insurance should, should something happen. Uh, and then you have yourself in a, in a hole right from the get-go. Um, you might not, as Mike said, you might not get paid for it. You, how, how do you bill for something that wasn't in your contract? Even though the owner asked you to do it, they're assuming it's part of your, your, uh, your base services and it, uh, it's not. And so now you've gotten, you've gotten uh, the double whammy. You're going to get sued for it and you didn't get paid for it. So those are huge risks. Um, so yeah, scope creep, every, I think every architect would jump on that and say, yeah, scope creep is a, is a big problem in our field. And it is, but I think that's the beauty of having a document that you're familiar with every single time and you use it every single time. You know where you stand and you know how to explain it to the owner, uh, what's included and what's not included. Instead of trying to rewrite your, your, your contract with the owner every single time, even if it's a letter agreement. Mike? No, I, I agree entirely. Great. So scope creep is pointed out as one of the, one of the risks that small firm practitioners should be looking out for. What else would be on the top of the list? Um, well, one thing I always, you know, encourage, uh, you know, architects or anyone who's going to be uh, got a contract put in front of them uh, and is expected to sign it is read the contract. I mean, you don't have to be uh, licensed as an attorney to be able to read a contract. The idea behind a contract is that both parties are memorializing their understanding of what each party is going to do. And if you find a clause in there, uh, that you just don't understand, it's perfectly acceptable to say to an owner, to whoever you're contracting with, you know, how can I perform this obligation if I don't understand it? So uh, we either need to, you know, write it in a language that I can understand and that we both understand, or uh, we need to cross it out altogether. And, and one of the most you know, confusing, you know, oftentimes confusing provisions in an agreement something like indemnity. Um, you know, I think most architects have probably come across indemnity agreements uh, and indemnity provisions in their contracts. And if you're an architect and you don't understand what, you know, your indemnity provision is saying and the kind of uh, indemnity an owner wants you to, uh, to sign, then you either need to have someone review it uh, who does understand it or just ask the question, what are you, what are you trying to look for here? What, are you, what, what kind of risks are you trying to account for with this language that I might not understand? So read, the, read contracts and, under, and at least give it a good shot at, like a, at, at a basic, do I understand what's being expected of me in this agreement um, kind of, a, of approach. And so I have two things to add. One, I want to just uh, emphasize what Mike just said not only you understanding it, but your entire staff who's working on the project understands what the contract says. Um, because you could understand it if you didn't pass and disseminate that down to your staff, uh, they might not understand what their the scope of work is for that matter. Um, and I always tell um, my staff, there's three things in a contract, I don't care which contract you sign, some are more elaborate than others, but there's, which we talked about a couple of them, money, uh, what are you going to get paid? Um, the scope, which we just talked about, and time. How long is it going to take you to do this? And what, what timetable have you agreed to? Uh, if your staff doesn't know what the milestones are um, uh, and how important they are, that's a contractual obligation. Um, the other thing I want to add is documentation on my end. When you have meetings with clients, regardless of what the contract says, you have to document everything. That's where scope creep comes into. If they say right away, Oh, what about this? And if you were in a meeting, you immediately say it's not in the original scope. Bring it up day one, not day 100. It's too late by then. You already, the train went down the tracks too far. I see that happening a lot. But uh, giving the owner continuous updates when you have meetings as to where we are, you know, are we on track, are we behind schedule, what information's lacking, and who didn't get it to you, who's at fault, that kind of thing. Um, owners don't like surprises, neither do we. So keep everybody um, on the same schedule is really important in updates. Got it. Any other things come top of mind in terms of risks that you see? Um, well, Sal already touched on it, but a lot of, uh, which is, you know, architects taking on responsibility and doing activities that aren't covered by insurance. And he, he covered it pretty well, but I think it's worth underscoring that, you know, that architects uh, and their professional liability insurance, you're, you're going to be able to pretty easily get uh, insurance for your own negligent acts. Uh, but as soon as you are taking on responsibility for, you know, other people's negligent acts or, 
you know, if you've make, made statements in your contracts or you're warranting something, you know, anything that goes beyond just responsibility for your negligent acts as an architect is going to be something that's probably not covered by your professional liability insurance. Um, so those are things that you should be looking at just in general as a with very skeptically. Um, and, and that's always a good negotiating point with an owner. Uh, if you're, if you're talking about something they've asked you to do or a contract provision that they want you to agree to, uh, to come back to them and say, I can't get insurance for that. That's a really good negotiating point. And so I'll add one more thing. Um, so we talked about uh, doing things that we weren't supposed to do. And there's also, I see this happening and I'm guilty of this. Well, you forgot to do something that was in your scope of work. For example, it's our responsibility before we sign an application for payment to get consent of surety. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, legal um, uh, documentation where architects signed an application for payment, the final application for payment or for, for substantial completion and, and, and forgot to get the consent of surety and paid the contractor in advance. Our job, if you don't do what you're, you're supposed to do, because those things kind of fall through the cracks, we're architects. Um, we want to design, we want to do, um, you know, all the fun things associated with architecture, but we forget about the paperwork that's associated with that. That's why I like contract administration. I think it's an important aspect and it seems to be the area that architects uh, get their butt into a sling more often than not uh, where, the, where the rubber meets the road during construction. So I, I, I think that's equally as important. Make sure you understand, Mike, Mike said before, read the contract and understand what it is you're supposed to do. Here's the steps you have to follow. How would you suggest that a firm owner approach a situation where a client is demanding that the architect use their contract and their forms and it turns out to be onerous? This is something I know that you know, architects deal with frequently. Sure. Yeah, that happens all the time, of course. Uh, and I am sure that most architects have ran into this and, and it's not a very, it, it's kind of a dead letter to say, well, let's start with AIA instead. Uh, that's not going to work, right? So you have to really look at what are they, you know, what, what are, you know, troubleshoot the contract or have, you know, um, you know, hire an attorney to actually review the contract. I think that's, especially in this kind of a situation where you're being asked to do things that you don't feel comfortable with, you know, hiring an attorney to put in a few hours worth of work to review it is well worth the money, even though attorneys can be expensive. Um, but also you've got to look at why are they asking you to do those things? Are there certain, you know, and, and maybe you can, you know, figure out before you sign the contract, you know, why is it, what are they exactly concerned about by that overreaching indemnity uh, agreement or, or something like that, that you can, um, that you can maybe negotiate a better standpoint, just, you know, starting point, just from understanding what their real concerns are. Uh, but I think all architects need to pay attention that if you're being asked to sign a terrible contract with unrealistic expectations, um, there's, you know, you can't stay in business by turning down every job, of course. And, but there are some there are some contracts and some clients that you and projects that you just shouldn't take um, if the risks are going to be too slanted against you um, and you don't feel like there's a good chance of success um, then it's you know occasionally passing on a project uh, if the risks are too high is 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 not the worst thing to do again i agree with mike you said it very well and but the reality is um, it happens on a daily basis where um, architects are asked uh, to, to sign um, unfair contracts. So at, at that point, each of us have to weigh the risk is, and, and look at it specifically. What's our risk? Um, wh what are we taking upon ourselves? Sometimes they're minimal. Uh, owners will ask us to do things that are fairly unreasonable and, and, and maybe they're past clients. So it really comes down to individually, is it, is it worth it? Is it, is it going to be worth it? And I think Mike's right. I think if more architects would turn down um, projects uh, and, and group together and say, well, we're not going to work under these conditions uh, with this contract, owners would probably wise up, but there's always that one person who will take the job on. But my attitude is let them take the risk and let them take the loss. Um, I, I can't do that to myself and my partners and my employees. Um, it's, it's too valuable, but it does happen um, more often than you think. And there are many, many architects who just take upon that risk. One thing we do is we, we give that, um, that contract to our insurance agent 
and, and ask them to review it. And they really give us good advice many times. Uh, and, and most of the time that we'll, we'll turn the contract down is when the, the insurance agent said, you're not covered for this particular aspect, should there be an issue. And that's, that's a, uh, a deal breaker right there for us. And one other thing I should mention is there's another strategy that you can you can easily use in negotiations over and over again. When you're being asked to do something that you are, are signing provisions or to agree to something that you're uncomfortable with, rather than just saying, I can't do that, um, you know, look for concessions. Uh, you know, if you want me to do this, then I need to get a waiver or I need to get a limitation of liability provision in order to account for that or to offset it. And I kind of use the you know, it's, I run into this, I feel, every single day. I have a uh, three-year-old daughter who is constantly asking me for everything. You know, she wants to ask me for, do this, Dad, do this, do that. And, uh, and I always get a concession out of her. If you, if you want an extra, you know, something, then you got to let me take, you, you got to take a bath first, you know. So you can use those same silly little things that I use with my three-year-old daughter in, in contract negotiations, um, you know. If, if you want this, then I need to get this for it and, and have in your, um, uh, you, you know, in your stable, the things that would be good for you, like limitation of liability provisions, waiver of consequential damages, the kind of things that you might want to be getting as an offset for something that a risk that you're accepting on behalf of an owner. Got it. Now, both of you have experience in litigation, construction defects, uh, Sal, you as an expert witness, Mike, you in a former life as a litigator, what are some common litigations, defects that you see when architects get pulled in the court? What are, what are some of these things that you all are saying? And if you have a totally crazy outlandish story that you can, that you can share, we'd love to hear it. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I can, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just start by Trade. saying the two things that I often, I saw the most, and as a litigator, I practiced for a few years in California and a few years in uh, the DC, Maryland area and water on the East Coast, it was always water issues on the West Coast, water, but to a, but to a larger degree, soils kinds of issues, because those are, you know, as an attorney, and I've never really worked for too many plaintiffs firms, but um, it's not too hard for me to see how they operate, you know, firms that are you know, and owners who are looking, you're looking for the bigger claims, right? And those are the ones that get, that, you know, the high dollar claims have to deal with, with water issues uh, and with soils and soils, you know, uh, kind of issues that, that have further permutations throughout the structure. Um, so. Um, with respect to an architect, the, I think the common thread that I've seen um, and I'm, again, this might be just me, but it's more ADA related issues where the architect missed uh, something in the, in, the, um, in the ADA law uh, that had to be in it. At, you know, it's, of course, the product is being sold on the market by a company. In one particular case, um, there was a stone that's manufactured by a prominent company here in the United States. They make a, 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 a stone tile for floor. Um, it doesn't meet ADA. It never did when the day it was used, it was made. But it's um, but the the point is it can be used for their applications. It doesn't have to be used on a horizontal surface. It could be used on a vertical surface, and it also is great. It's fine for residential, but in a commercial public building, it just doesn't meet the code. Well, the the architect. Uh, pressed and used it several times on several projects and he just got caught one time and and actually for his defense said he oh i used it in these other buildings and and they were illegal in that buildings too it's just the code official didn't catch it so that was just one example but i i've seen more and more ada issues get ra uh, raised in front of me um for defending architects um most of the time i it, it's tough to get them uh, out of that situation. Um, I've not been successful to this point, but so that's, that's what I see. I'm curious when in an ADA lawsuit, who's the one that brings that lawsuit generally? Um, the, uh, in my, in my cases, uh, one, it was the state. Um, and in another case, it was actually the owner because, uh, the code official wouldn't give them a certificate of occupancy. Um, and they wouldn't let them in the building at the last 11th hour. And the owner, then brought, they tried to get it resolved initially and it was just too late. So they actually brought a lawsuit against the architect, unfortunately. 
Got it. And I, I'm racking my brain for the, the ADA requirements, and I'm trying to think what could cause a stone not to comply. Would you share with me what? <laughs> sure. What? Um, it it's, uh, has to do with uh, the amount of lippage on the stone inside the stone, not necessarily from one stone to the next. Um, but it's actually the rough, the, 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 you know, we're, we're caught in this world of is it slip resistant? Um, or um, because obviously the rougher the stone, the better it is. But if it's too rough, um, it, it's too hard for people to walk, particularly the elderly, they shuffle their feet. So there's a lot of testing out there. Um, and so we're caught in this, this no man's land of in between. And then in this case, the stone was incredibly rough. It was a, um, you know, a um, heavy cleft stone, which looked great. But when you put it on the floor, it just doesn't meet the code. Um, and there's a lot of them that are out there, believe it or not, but they're mostly made for vertical applications, not necessarily horizontal in a public building. And do you remember how that one ended up getting resolved? So <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, the client won and they um, hired another uh, installer to come in, rip out all the stone, all of it and put back another product, but it was very expensive. Uh, the building was absolutely 100% complete, but they couldn't get a CO just because of the, the lobby floor, shut the whole building down. So it's pretty major. Those, those are the little things that keep architects up at night. You know, oh, you see that coming. You're like, you'd never guess. And uh, here you go. Well, <laughs> gentlemen, where, where should people go to find out more about the contract documents and in general and uh, other resources that you all would steer them to? Sure. Um, best place to go is aiacontracts.org. We, uh, our webpage has uh, a ton of resources. You can look up all the documents that we offer, we offer over 200 now for all different delivery uh, methods, you know, from design, bid, build documents to design, build, CM, uh, at risk and as advisor. Uh, you can look, you can find free uh, samples of all of our documents on there. You can also find webinars that we've done, you know, over the last few years uh, on the website, but you can also, we have a YouTube channel too, uh, where you can find webinars that we've done uh, in the past. Uh, so, and aside from just having our, our contracts on our website, we have a lot of guides uh, on there as well that, you know, if you want to read more about, you know, uh, how, you know, BIM protocols or digital data protocols, we've got, you know, great resources um, uh, on our website as well. And most of the stuff that we have on there is free uh, as far as our, our resources and learning tools are all free. Um, so that'd be the, that, that's a good starting point. Yeah, the resources are really good. And uh, I can't say enough about the AIA support with their staff. Um, if you have an issue, you call them up and they're happy to help out and offer support. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today on the Business of Architecture show. Thank you, Enoch. It's been great, great to be here. Thank you. Appreciate it.